back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, fighting a little bit of a cold, so I'll do the best I can as you bear with me. And they are tracking and tracing the homeless, coming soon to a decaying metropolis near you. We got that story, plus arresting Bitcoin users. But first, we head back to Silk Road as Xi Jinping's new Silk Road Summit will step up China's endorsement of globalization. This comes via Bloomberg, whose article title is only slightly different from Corbett's there. Xi's new Silk Road Forum sets Chinese tone for globalization 2.0. China will ask 28 world leaders to sign on to President Xi Jinping's signature initiative on globalization, bolstering a range of Chinese foreign policy objectives. The Belt and Road Forum is Xi's cornerstone initiative to connect China with Europe, Asia, and Africa through infrastructure projects. Not only is it a showcase for Xi's globalization credentials that he championed in a speech at Davos back in January, but the high-profile event will also serve as a counterpoint to America's inward pivot under President Donald Trump. A draft communique combines commitments to open international markets with endorsements of China's diplomatic goals. But Dennis Wilder, former senior director for Asia at the U.S. National Security Council during the George W. Bush administration, said of the draft, it's likely to backfire a little on the Chinese. There will be some sense in Europe and the U.S. that China is making mistakes a little bit full of itself and enthralled with its new position and it can be tone deaf to others. This document includes a pledge to oppose all forms of protectionism, language which was removed from a communique issued by a group of 20 finance ministers in March at the insistence of the Trump administration. Now, James, we talked about Silk Road back in September of 2016 here on New World Next Week. UN and China agree on Silk Road initiative cooperation. So here we are back on Silk Road, James. That's right. And as you point out, I just recently wrote for the forecaster, Globalization 2.0, China ushering in newer, shinier, happier New, new World Order, um, which is exactly the point. And this Globalization 2.0 that's being thrown around right now isn't my formulation. It is the Chinese government's formulation through their Chinese state mouthpiece media, which ran a, recently ran a, uh, an article about how the this, this Silk Road is going to be Globalization 2.0. Oh, it's it's the happy, nice, cooperative version of globalization against, uh, as opposed to the American, you know, barrel of a gun globalization that we've seen in the past few decades. So it's going to be everyone's going to be happy with this. At least that's what uh, the Chaicom media is trying to tell people. So in the run up to this forum, which is going to be taking place next week, and uh, involves a lot of world leaders. There's going to be 28 different nations uh, represented here, including potentially North Korea, I, I see in the latest headlines. Uh, they're going to be hammering globalization may or may not look like. So they've uh, come up with some draft formulations of uh, text about uh, what this is, what these nations are going to be signing into. And in preparation for this, China has been striking sort of miniature deals with Greece and China and India and Russia and Iran and all these other different nations. So uh, it is an important initiative that's moving forward. For people who don't know, this is about the Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road, i.e. the one road, one belt, one road policy, or OBOR, you're going to be seeing that a lot more, O-B-O-R, um, is the way that this is being referred to. And it's China's idea for creating this giant uh, infrastructure for trading along its trading routes, basically between China and Western Europe. So everywhere in between and all of the the seaways around there as well. Um, China is trying to extend their influence by developing all these infrastructure projects um, through things like their AIIB, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. So they're pumping in up to a trillion dollars. Uh, they've so far committed to various projects along the, this One Belt, One Road corridor. Uh, basically to help build everyone's infrastructure and make the trading go smoother. And oh, by the way, it kind of helps the Chinese economy too. Yay, win-win, right? Um, so this is the idea and this is what it's being sold as. But as always, the third level to this 3D chess is things like uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi having met just late last month with... Guess who? Henry Kissinger. Yes, it's always the same slime balls that are uh, floating around in this swamp 
that are really directing this process. And I want people to understand that this is what it's about. The AIIB just signed a new cooperation agreement to deepen their cooperation with the World Bank, which they've already signed agreements with before. Um, and the BRICS Bank uh, VP is an, an IMF executive director. I mean, it's all interlocking at the top. So all of this rhetoric about, oh, it's opposed, it's opposed to NATO, it's opposed to World Bank, it's opposed to IMF, is a charade at the very top level. There are interconnections. So this Globalization 2.0 is globalization 1.0 with a new face. And I think people have to understand that. So that's, uh, I'll direct people over to my article where I wrote about this in some more detail. But I, I think this forum that's coming up next week is going to be something to keep your eyes on. And yeah, I, di I didn't know about the Kissinger part. There he is again. So much like the late, not great David Rockefeller, they all knew, hey, I think China's going to be the model. It's going to be the model nation. As we move to our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 310 for May 11th, 2017, we go down to the land of slime balls and swamps, Florida. The first state to arrest anyone for selling Bitcoin is now passing laws to imprison them. This comes via Brave New Coin, whose original headline for this story was Florida passes laws making crimes with Bitcoin money laundering. House Bill 1379 recently passed in Florida, which defines virtual currency and prohibits its use in laundering criminal proceeds. The bill adds the term virtual currency to the definition of monetary instruments under Florida's Money Laundering Act. The legislation is currently in the hands of the state's governor and expected to be signed soon. The act defines digital currency as a, quote, medium of exchange in electronic or digital format that is not a coin or currency of the United States or any other country, end quote. Previously, the act only applied to money laundering to legacy financial transactions of various types, including bank deposits, investments, and wire transfers. The resulting outcome is that criminals using cryptocurrencies, like how they just put those together, criminals using cryptocurrencies will be charged with money laundering as well as the underlying criminal activity in the first place. Cyber criminals have taken advantage of our antiquated laws for too long. Bitcoin bypasses the traditional banking system and our state's laws simply have not caught up to the upsurge in criminality in the world of cyber currency, end quote, claimed Democratic House Representative Jose Felix Diaz, a sponsor of the bill. Now, what this all centers around is this. Passing this legislation brings to rest a multi-year long series of court proceedings and uncertainty centered around the arrest of a seller of bitcoins. The bill is a direct response to the failure of Miami-Dade police to be able to prosecute Mitchell Espinoza, a Miami-based website designer and local Bitcoins seller who was charged with illegally transmitting and laundering $31,000 worth of Bitcoins near the end of 2013, in a case that kind of sounds like entrapment at best. And in our show notes, I will include the link to Florida House Bill 1379. Of course, watching those Kind of congressional bills can be a bit of a, a puzzle, but we'll include that link and you can see where it's at. I don't believe it's it's signed and sealed and delivered, so it is somewhat still developing. James? Well, last week we were talking about various uh, stories that show how the government believes that it owns you and can control you and what you do um, with yourself and your body and everything else around you and the way you transact with other people. Here's another shining example of that, because at base... These cryptocurrency transactions are exchanging strings of letters and numbers between people. I mean, that's ultimately all this is. And to some extent, this is an argument that the worst thing that Bitcoin ever did was advertise itself as a currency. I mean, of course, it can be used as such, but all it is is strings of letters and numbers that are being passed around between people. But the government feels that it can come in and stop people from doing that. And why? precisely as Democratic House Representative Jose Felix, Felix Diaz is quoted as saying here, because Bitcoin bypasses the traditional banking system. It, they are essentially saying it is illegal for you to bypass our banking system. Now, why do you think that is? I think so much can be understood about the nature of the world that they're trying to construct for us by understanding what they make illegal for us to do. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, why exactly? Why can't we bypass the traditional banking system? Oh, it's because criminals can use this. Well, criminals can use cash. Criminals can use all sorts of other things. Criminals breathe oxygen. Should we outlaw oxygen? I mean, it is it is a stupid, childish um, way of framing this, but it does, I think, go to the core of what they're so afraid of, which is people transacting outside of their system. And that's, I mean, this is the best uh, endorsement of cryptocurrency I could think of. And 
uh, it's particularly interesting coming as just as Japan has just made it, a, a, you know, a, officially a, a currency that you can use. And now we see Bitcoin starting its shoot to the moon. It's uh, past $1,700 now. So uh, I do get a little bit of schadenfreude out of the people who were laughing and mocking and, oh, cryptocurrency nonsense back when it was $50 a Bitcoin when I first got my first Bitcoin by selling a DVD. And now it's, what, $1,700 plus dollars? And I have bought real things in the real world with this strings of letters and numbers. So it's it's here. And the only question is, you know, if people are going to participate in it or if they're allowed to participate in it by the powers that shouldn't be. And this is in some ways, I think, probably a reaction to, you know, post 9-11, all the Patriot Act laws that basically said, oh, we're going to look at all your bank accounts and all your transactions and, you know, just to make sure you're not, a you know, a terrorist or something. So as we move to our third and final story this week on Neural Next Week, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanted to add in a story that, that just came to me just as, as we were just about to go to air here via Activist Post. Study highlights growing significance of cryptocurrencies. More than 3 million people, three times the previous estimates, are estimated to be actively using cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So finds the first global cryptocurrency benchmarking study by the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. And you can get that and you can get the PDF and read that whole story. Now, as I was about to say, our third and final story this week on New World Next Week, we head to that decaying metropolis of New York City with a story from Wired that notes, the city that never sleeps has become the city with the most people who have no home to sleep in. As rising rents outpace income growth across the five boroughs, some 62,000 people, nearly 40% of them children, live in homeless shelters. And these are rates the city hasn't seen since the Great Depression. As New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio faces re-election in November, his reputation and electoral prospects depend in part on his ability to reverse this troubling trend. In the mayor's estimation, combating homelessness effectively will require opening 90 new shelters across the city and expanding the number of outreach workers who canvass the streets every day offering aid and housing. The effort will also require having the technology in place to ensure that work happens as efficiently as possible. To that end, the city is rolling out a new tool, Street Smart that aims to give city agencies and nonprofit groups a comprehensive view of all the data being collected on New York City's homeless on a daily basis. And I think this this last line that I'll read in the article just has to be read in sort of a commercial voice. Think of Street Smarts as a customer relationship management system for the homeless. How's that sound, James? Tracking and tracing the homeless. Will this be used to sort of help people? aside from that discussion and conversation, or will it use to basically criminalize people and track and trace them like the rest of us already are? Yeah, well, that's the point. I mean, they're creating the open air prison and it's just uh, slotting people further and further into it. And as always, these things are always rolled out on in order, probably uh, animals and pets, and then uh, criminals and or insane, you know, psychiatric patients and homeless. And those are the way sort of test groups for society. We introduce and roll out the, uh, the, the technology, you know, oh, you chip your dog, you chip a criminal. Why wouldn't you chip your son or daughter so that you never lose them? Um, or, hey, we can track homeless people on the street. Well, wow, by the way, we could track your, your children. Um, this is obviously just the test case. And it's just a question of steeping people into it. And as we've seen over the decades, all it takes is the, the introduction of the idea, the selling of the idea. This is part of the marketing campaign for this type of idea. And eventually, it'll, and who could, how could you say anything bad about it? They're trying to help the homeless. They want to make sure they can track them and, and see that they haven't, you know, frozen to death on a park bench or something. It's a wonderful system for keeping people safe and happy and uh, swaddled in the loving arms of the government. What could go wrong? We've talked in some ways, and I know I've talked about it on my own shows, that somehow, you know, sometimes those people at the, at the lower rungs of society actually can squeak by and not be in the grips of the powers that shouldn't be. If you talk about biometrics and some of these other kind of track and trace systems that don't actually work really well on people with dark complected skin. It's like, what a, what a fantastic gift in some ways that you're going to escape that. Good God, you, you tracking homeless people, it's just... It, it's all the sci-fi movies, it's all the dystopic movies, any of the references we've ever made back in the show, it's, it's all there. And that, in some ways, 
unfortunately, as a lot of what New World Next Week is, we are giving you the stories really before they happen and hopefully giving you the news that you need to know about. I want to mention one update, James, unless you've got any last words on tracking the homeless. No, I just, I think you're right. I think uh, this is one of those stories where they're trying to counteract the relative freedom of homelessness, if you know what I'm saying. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of sort of psychology and philosophy to un- unpack there. But I'll just mention a update to a story that we covered last week. It was our cover story last week. But they have arrested a second German soldier in that false flag refugee plot. So we'll include that in the show notes, just like we include everything else that we say and mention in these shows so you can continue the research for yourself. And we do this independently non-commercially, and we do it with your support. And we do it with things like cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and Patreon and other ways. And you can, of course, find those things at MediaMonarchy.com slash support and CorbettReport.com. Is it slash support? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> People will find it. <laughs> All right, James, thank you again for three great stories. We'll do it again next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care.